Good afternoon and welcome. Welcome to the Mark Twain Library. Thank you everyone for coming today for what I'm sure will be a, a fantastic presentation. Uh, Dr. Dew has already presented to many of the students from Easton Reading yesterday at the high school. And I, I have heard that it was a wonderful day for the high school, and I'm sure it will be equally as wonderful here. I'm Beth Domeniani, the director of the library. Before we get started with the formal presentation, I just needed to say a couple of thank yous. I first of all want to say very much a thank you to Sarah Billick and Marianne Carmen sitting in our front row, who brought this idea to the library, orchestrated it, met with our speaker, and were able to bring this all to fruition. They've worked very hard, and they have really, this has been a true labor of love for them. So thank you so much. Uh, I want to thank you also to the League of Women Voters, who has been sponsoring this program with us. And we'll hear from Kim from the League in just a moment and to the Congregational Church, and I see Reverend Dean is back there. And uh, they will be, uh, they will be uh, hosting an event tomorrow as well. So, without further ado, I'm going to have Kim Riley, Kim Riley come up and speak with you. Thank you very much again for coming. Good afternoon. Nice to see everybody on such a beautiful day. Thanks for coming inside. Um, and sharing this time with us. Um, as uh, Beth said, I am the president of the League of Women Voters. It's a wonderful group. Um, and I am so happy to see so many League members here and so many from the greater community here. If you're not familiar to the League, here's my commercial. Um, we're a nonpartisan organization uh, and that promotes voter registration. We work to help get out the vote. We educate voters on critical public policy issues, and we encourage active participation in the political process. Again, we are nonpartisan, and we also welcome both women and men as members of our league. I'm proud to say that this year we brought on two men to our board. So um, we, we truly are um, open to, to everyone who wants to get involved. Um, this is our 65th year as an active organization in the community of Reading. Um, and we've really had a great start to the year. We had a couple candidates for, uh, not candidates, we had a couple forums with our legislators. Susan Oslander is here. She's one of our league members at Meadow Ridge, and she, they had about 70 folks from Meadow Ridge come in and uh, speak with our legislators. Um, it was a wonderful evening there. Then we had a, a lovely evening at High State Arboretum with our, our three legislators. And now we're here today. Uh, coming up, I just want everybody to know that on Wednesday, October 23rd, we're having our municipal candidates forums. So please come out to the community center. We will have uh, the candidates that are running for the Reading Board of Ed in the first debate and the second debate candidates running for the um, Eastern Reading Region 9 Board of Ed, otherwise known as the High School Board of Ed. Um, so please join us then. And I just want to get everybody excited about 2020. It's a big year for the League of Women Voters. <laughs> um, it's the it's a centennial of the founding of the League. It's also the centennial of the passage of the 19th Amendment guaranteeing and protecting the women's constitutional right to vote. So you'll be very We'd love to, to have you join and uh, like us on Facebook so you uh, stay, keep abreast of what, what's going on. Um, this is a community effort today. We have the library, the League of Women Voters, uh, uh, our church, the, my church, the First Church of Christ Con Congregational, and the high school. It's really uh, phenomenal to bring all those partners together. And I really want to thank everyone who, who pulled together and shared their time and talents in the planning process. A big thank you to Beth uh, from the library and her staff. Elaine Sanders is here. Uh, she's the adult pro programming coordinator. Um, Amy Nonnenmacher, Catherine Dusenberry um, were also uh, helpful from our library crew. 
uh, from jo Joe Barlow, um, I believe our um, vice principal, Jen with Jen Damaris was involved, and she's a former history teacher. She's really, or I don't know if she still teaches history, but she's really wonderful. And then, um, of course, Marianne and Sarah, thank you so much for um, bringing this opportunity to us. I just want to talk a few minutes about what I thought I was very aware about my view of racism and any sort of things I thought. Because I grew up in New York City. I thought that was a fairly progressive uh, place to grow up. I had a very uh, enlightened education and I had very strong family role models. As a young teen, and I just don't know why I read these books, but I read Black Like Me, which was first published in 1961. If you haven't read it, I mean, I read it, I think I was 13. I don't, uh, it was on our summer reading list because I don't remember it being part of the curriculum. But it's about a journalist who um, goes into the deep south and he dyes his skin. And the darker he gets, he's white, the more and more racism he experiences. It's a really interesting book. And I, as a young teenager, it made a big impact. Then I read Richard Spike's Black Boy. And then I read Malcolm X's autobiography. But um, I just, I think that just sort of somehow grabbed my attention. So I'm not, I really don't know why I read the books, but I think they just sort of gave me some perspective, even growing up in New York City where uh, I don't think racism was really uh, for, forefront in our mind, although there was a lot going on at that time. Um, and then I went and then got a graduate degree at Fordham um, in social services, and we had to take a class called Oppression, which I was really thought, um, I don't think I need this. But <laughs> why do I have to do this? But um, it, was, it was a really interesting class. Um, we read a lot of different, different essays, uh, had a lot of different perspectives. Um, and then I read Charles' book. And there are still things that I went, oh my goodness, I didn't realize that I had those thoughts. Or I didn't realize this maybe was something in my, my childhood that has maybe still has some sort of impact. So thank you, uh, Charles, for your book. Thank you. And I think um, I love in the ending of his book, he says, we can do better, and we have to shuck off the last vestiges of that reptilian skin of racism, even though we do not think we are still carrying it around. So thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to pass this over to Marianne and Sarah to say a few words, and then we get to hear from Charles. Thank you. Kim, thank you so much. That was beautiful. As they say in theater, follow that. <laughs> Can everybody hear us? Is this, are we left in the back? OK, good. Um, I want to thank you, Kim, and also the League of Women Voters. You thanked everybody, and I want to just say ditto to that. Um, this town has been so welcoming and so warm and so curious and interested. Um, so thank you. Um, most of all, though, I really want to thank Charles Dew, um, Dr. Dew, for agreeing to come today um, and sharing his valuable time so very generously with our group. Um, you may or may not have read that Dr. Dew teaches a full course load um, at Williams College. And he carved out the time to correspond with us and arrange for this day and then to come this day, yesterday, and tomorrow to educate us and to enlighten us and honestly to inspire us, I think. No, I know. Um, a very, very brief history of today because this is, this is really all about this important information and this wonderful man. Um, a little over a year ago, um, my son and I took a little side trip to Williamstown, uh, Massachusetts. If you haven't been there, go. I assume you all have. It's, it's a wonderful town. And we pinky swore with each other not to spend the whole day in the bookstore. There's a Williams College bookstore is wonderful. And we said, we're just going to pop in and pop out. How'd that work out for us? Well, um, <laughs> I picked, I went right to the shelf that says um, books by our, um, our professors here at Williams College. I like to do that. And then in honor of our promise, I just picked out the skinniest one. <laughs> it also had a beautiful, beautiful cover with a beautiful child on it. He'll talk about that. Um, and I think like, as with fine wines, books, you should pick by the 
cover, the label. <laughs> and so I started thumbing through it, thinking this will be quick. It wasn't. Um, a couple hours later, I was halfway through it. I was deeply in love with the book. I went to buy it. The guy behind the counter said, yeah, it's been like that all day. It is a wonderful, wonderful book. I won't go into it. I've been trying to explain to folks how wonderful it is. It's better when I just give it to them, then they get it right away. I usually, you know, besides, he's here. <laughs> um, it has a thought-provoking title, The Making of a Racist. That also interested me for lots of reasons that you'll hear about. Um, so what I wanted to do right away again was share my enthusiasm with friends, with family, they will tell you the ones that are here. I did do that. Um, in particular, Marianne, who read it right away um, and just felt the same way as I did. This, as many people as possible need to hear this. This is, this is too wonderful. And so, with very little further provocation, about eight or nine months ago, um, I emailed to Charles Do which I've never done before. I've never written to an author. I've read a lot of books, a bunch of books, not as many as I should, but as many as I can. And, and this is the first time I felt really compelled to write to the author and thank him. So I did that. And it's probably a wonderful sort of, I don't know, indication of the generosity of spirit that the very next day I got a response from this man, again, with a full teaching load and lots of students that he advises. And it was the middle of the semester, nonetheless he wrote. Um, and then we got to talking and we corresponded for a while and then Marianne and I went to visit. Um, and then something kind of wonderful happened. We asked him if he would consider coming here to, to talk here at the library. Marianne raised that idea, the library, I think we had them at Hello. They read the book and said this is important. Um, and again, another sign of his generosity of spirit, he said, absolutely. And I'd be very open to that. And then the rest is history with the rest of the town, sort of um, the League of Women Voters at the forefront, forwarding all of this. And I think that it's, what I really want to highlight, and then I'm going to stop, is the rare, extraordinary generosity of spirit that I think is the, the term that I'm thinking of is the kind of antithesis of the racism and the small-mindedness and the lack of tolerance that Dr. Dew speaks so passionately about, that generosity of spirit is the only counter that we really have to that, to not respond in kind. And he speaks with passionate equanimity and also eloquence against that. Um, and so I guess without really anything else, I want to introduce Mary Ann, who's going to introduce Dr. Dew, and just you're in for a wonderful experience with that. So thank you so much, Mary. Would, the day would not have been possible in any way without Mary Ann's organization. Without her. So you came to hear Charles do, so I'm going to make this quick. Um, there's an anti-racist we might name Mahatma Gandhi. You might have heard of him. Um, he said, if we could change ourselves, the tendencies of the world would also change. We need not wait to see what others do. So when Sarah and I first raised the idea of Professor Dews coming to the Reading community to talk about the persistent disease of racism in our country, everyone to a person, to a person, and each organization we spoke with responded in kind with the same characteristic generosity of spirit as Professor Dew and an equal level of enthusiasm. The enthusiasm is really what made this happen so quickly and easily for everyone. Um, so we must thank the League of Women Voters who recognized in their mission of nonpartisan community political engagement, this, this was an important issue for everyone of every age. And once we realized that, um, we went to the library. And the library and its gracious and hardworking leadership, programming staff, and volunteers, people like Beth, Amy, Catherine, Elaine, Jennifer, um, who somehow bring the wider world to this place called Reading in remarkable and creative ways. I mean, Charles, you're, you're following up John Hamm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, sorry. Uh, thank you to the Joe Barlow High School administration and students. The students were remarkable yesterday. Who made sure it's American? The school made sure it's American history students could hear the first person and personal account of life during segregation. 
but also the hope and possibility of cultural transformation. And then the Reading Congregational Church's Racial Justice Committee and Dean Oliver for welcoming this community talk and read with open arms and extending the learning experience to an even greater audience here. And Dr. Dew will be speaking there tomorrow at 11.45 um, a.m. open to the community. And then um, thank you all for being here today to hear Dr. Dew's story. The story of us who all yearn to learn better and be better. And that's through honest confrontation with our country's history and our own moral principles. So, without further ado. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to sit because the students said Joel Barlow wore me out yesterday. <laughs> Boy, did I get an education. I, I'm a college teacher. I start my class at 1 to 10 in the afternoon. <laughs> my alarm went off at 6 a.m. <laughs> and Mary, uh, Mary Ann called me to make sure I would get up. So, <laughs> um, There's some extra seats toward the front if the people who are standing would like to sit. Uh, there's some places here, so, so please come ahead. Um, I realize John Hamm is a tough act to follow, <laughs> and I won't even try. But I have my own uh, special uh, humorous moment, and that is that I've got the Williams College Facebook with Dean Allberg's freshman picture. <laughs> I agreed to keep this under wraps, but told him it would cost him. <laughs> and I promised to put any blackmail into the collection plate. <laughs> he corresponded with a dollar a peak, and that goes in the collection. <laughs> so if you've got a spare buck and you want to spend it, uh, he was a he was a boy of the '80s. With uh, well, I, I won't I won't spoil. It. I won't spoil it. Uh, I realize John Hamm is a tough act to follow, and, and I'm not even going to try. Um, it, it's hard to be humorous about what we're going to be talking about today, but, but I hope we will at least be able to get a laugh or two in. Uh, thank you for coming on such a beautiful day. Um, it's, uh, it's a reformed racist you're listening to when you could be out there enjoying this. Um, but I think what we're going to talk to each other about today, and really the Q&A will be more interesting than anything I say. Um, I think this is important. I think it is topical. Unfortunately, I think it is too much with us, more so than we thought, perhaps naively, um, in earlier years when things seemed to be moving in a different direction. Um, so I had no idea when I published this book in August of 2016, on the eve of a presidential election, that the book would be as timely as it has become. And I've gotten a number of invitations from communities around the country, including small towns in the South, Midwest, to just come and talk to the community because people were upset and they were looking for a way to bring people together and talk about issues that had become uh, even more painful uh, since that, that summer when this book was published. So every chance I get, I try to do this. I must tell you, uh, Williams has a tradition called Mountain Day. And it's normally the first Friday in October when all the students are freed from classes and head to the mountains. I set this up for the first possible mountain day. <laughs> and when I told, well, they saw in the syllabus, class will not meet today, and they were pumped. Huh? <laughs> and if you've read the book, you know that it's an odd hybrid of my own story growing up on the white side of the color line in the Jim Crow South, coupled with a, a historian's attempt to put on that cap <laughs> and talk about something quite different not how I grew up, but something that happened in the South's past that had a very powerful effect on me. So that's what this document represents. Uh, if you've read the book, you know it's reproduced in the book. It's not as clear as I would like it to be, but it's reproduced there. And I, I begin almost all of my classes in Southern history by passing this out. And the first question I ask the students is, what are you looking at? What is this? So I'll ask you the same thing. What are you looking at here? What is this? We're looking at 
A slave price list. A slave price list. Issued by the firm of Gretzen Gregory, uh, Gregory Richmond, Virginia, dated August 2nd, 1860. We'll talk about that date in a moment. I passed this out to the students at Joel Barlow when we, we had our sessions yesterday. And I could see the shock in their faces as they realized what they were looking at. That, that, that moment of recognition when what they were seeing represented the commodification of men, women, and children as chattel property, the equivalent of livestock, who were bought and sold as if they were subhuman, non-human. And, and that got us going, and, and they asked questions about this, and we talked about that, and we talked about the way in which, which that, that fitted into the book. And I want to take a minute to look at this and go over it with you. Uh, I'm a historian. This is what we do. We look at documents and we talk about it. But, but the fact is that this document led to this book. And that's why it's such a strange combination. It, it, it's, it's my story as, as best I can tell it. But it also entails an examination of the world behind this document. Because when I first saw this, I had been sitting in my office at the college and I got a call from the Rare Book Librarian over at the Chapin Library, which is our magnificent rare book and manuscript library at Williams. And it was 1997 and he said, I've just gotten hold of something I think you will want to see. So for one, one of those office hours, I had no students, so I walked over to the library. And when I held this in my hand and looked at it, I felt like I had been slugged in the stomach. Because here on a single page was the essence of the South slave system. Human beings as property. And I had, had never seen such a clear manifestation of that. And the reason why I felt the, the, the visceral reaction I did to it was I had a, a, a clarifying moment, personal moment, that, that we occasionally experience in our lives. I started looking at this and I said, how could my antebellum white southern ancestors, and they were all white and they were all from the south, how could they have been complicit in this? How could they have looked at this world and not seen it for the abhorrent evil that it inherently was? And I said, how could they do this? And, and I had a thought in the back of my mind. I had a relative, a man named Ancestor, a man named Thomas Roderick Dew who was the president of the College of William and Mary. And in the aftermath of Nat Turner's slave insurrection in Southampton County, Virginia, 1831, the Virginia legislature had held what turned out to be the last free and full debate over slavery that occurred in the antebellum South. And during the course of that debate, some legislators said, we've got to get rid of this institution that produced Nat Turner in the carnage that he generated. More slaves were killed than whites, and many innocent slaves were killed, as whites sought justice for what had been done. Justice, quote unquote. This is a slave insurrection, a rising of the oppressed. But he was asked to review that debate. And Thomas Roderick Dew, in the course of reviewing the debates in the Virginia legislature, which is the title of his book, laid the foundation for the pro-slavery argument. He was present at the beginning of the intellectual defense of slavery, and his efforts laid the foundation for 30 years of intellectual defense of the institution of slavery by the best minds of the Old South. This is what they were defending, and my ancestor had played a key role in that process and in, in sustaining and upholding this system. Let's take a look at this document for just a minute. Be, be, be a student, uh, and I'll try to be uh, more or less uh, 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 an entertaining teacher. Um, anybody see anything in this that is particularly telling to them? When they look at it, anything that sort of leaps off the page at them? There's a lot of money involved. There is a lot of money involved. And that is a very important phenomenon. Slavery in the Old South was hugely profitable. Cotton was in demand 
in the, in the 19th century like oil has been in demand in our own day. Fortunes were made in the Deep South growing cotton. The overwhelming majority of it that went to market was grown by slave men and women and children. Everybody was in the field in a slave camp. If you want to translate these dollar figures into contemporary American dollars in terms of purchasing power, multiply these figures by 30. And a, and, and a quick and easy 30 plus any of these figures will give you astonishing figures. The fact that this is a printed document I asked the students at Joel Barlow this yesterday, and one very bright young lady raised her hand and nailed it. The fact that this is a printed document, does that tell you anything? They weren't trying to hide anything? They weren't trying to hide anything? That happened a lot. It happened a lot. That's what she said. They had a stack of these things. They used them all the time. They used them every day. There was a daily market report of the slave system, the sort of thing you'd get from your stockbroker if you had money in the stock market. And they, they, they tried to read the market. Is it going to be a bull? Is it going to be a bear? Which way is it moving? Yeah, a printed form. Richmond, August 2nd, 1860. We beg leave to give you the state of our Negro market and quote them as follows. And then the categories begin. Extra men. Number one, doe. Doe means ditto in the 19th century. Second rate or ordinary, ditto. Extra girls, number one, ditto. Second rate or ordinary, ditto. And then, boys, children, beginning at four feet high and going up by three inch increments to five feet high, and then the line, girls of the same height as boys, about the same prices. Any of you have any grandchildren, children, little ones around who are four feet high? About how old are they? We measure first graders. Pardon? Four feet. We're like penguins. <laughs> okay. Four four feet high. Anybody? Guess a guess an age? Five. Eight or nine. More like eight or nine. People people are younger in the in, in the nineteenth century. <coughs> shorter. Shorter. I'm sorry. We're shorter. We're we're, we're smaller. <laughs> they they were smaller in the nineteenth century. I found out about the, the, the height that this meant through two ways. I looked at the customs manifests of, of slave cargoes that were shipped by water uh, from Richmond to New Orleans. And in a letter that I encountered, and I'll, I'll describe in a minute why, why I read the, the letters of slave traders, um, I encountered a letter that I'm going to read to you because it, it epitomizes the, the, the inherent abhorrence that was at work in this system. Uh, this, is, this is reprinted in my book. Somebody uh, who has read this may well remember it. It's hard to forget it. This is a letter from a man in uh, Smith Road, North Carolina, a man named Dunlap, to Betson Gregory. Betson Gregory, right here. I write you this to ascertain the price of Negroes in Richmond at this time. I want to buy five boys or girls from eight and a half to twelve years old, or from five and a half to four and a half feet high. You will please answer this and inform me whether I can get them in Richmond and at what price. That's all he was looking for. Children. No mother, no father, children. And he wants them five and a half to four and a half feet high, eight to twelve years of age. So right there. Is the, is the evidence that you need to put an age to these, these children, these boys and girls, with these heights uh, indicated in the price list. Um, every, every man in the South, probably, and a good many young men in the South, would know what these categories consisted of. Uh, it, was a, it was a measure of masculinity in the Old South to be plugged into and aware of the slave market. I hate to use parallels because they are so easy to distort, but it would be like a teenager now being able to walk onto a used car lot and not buy a lemon because the, the society was so much wrapped up in this system 
that you learn as a, at an early age as a white what the slave market was. At an even earlier age as a slave, you, you learn what slavery and the slave market was. So they would know what these categories meant. A number one or ex extra man, top category. That would be a young man, 18, 19, 20 years old, well muscled, with no marks of the whip, the lash on his back to indicate that he had been a discipline problem, free of small park, smallpox scars to, to indicate that he had been free of disease. He would have to roll up his pants and run across the floor of the auction house so his action, quote unquote, could be observed. If this sounds like a thoroughbred horse, they use so much of the language of the livestock trade in the slave trade. They referred to shipping parcels going to New Orleans. They talked of good stock. They used all of the language of a livestock market. The extra man would be designated probably as a plowman or plowboy. That was the toughest job, break the soil. And the reason slavery was so effective and so efficient was every member of the, the community from, from age 60, 65 down worked in the fields, men, women, and children. And they organized the gang with the point best worker on the front to set the pace, and then the three-quarter hands, the half hands, the, the one-quarter hands, which would be children 10 years old, would be breaking the soil, breaking up the clods with hoes, the women and children would come along and use a stick to get the soil ready for a seed. The child would put the seed in the soil and another child would cover it up as they went through the road. Overseers mounted, slave drivers with whips mounted to keep the pace of the gang going. Economists have estimated that slave gangs were 35% more efficient than free workers in the fields because of this pushing system. And they would have their, their cotton crop weighed after they picked for a day. And if that weight came in short from the previous day, they were subject to the whip. If it came in above the previous day, that was their set standard for the next day. So the system was designed to maximize profitability and product, all of which was made possible by that clever Connecticut Yankee, Eli Whitney, who came up with what? In 1793, the cotton gin. I should have brought my bag of short staple cotton with me. I've got it sitting in my office at school. Uh, one of my students brought it back after a vacation in Georgia. And he had gone out in the field and pick, picked this cotton. He was in my class. And he brought it back. And, it, and it's one because the seeds are like sand spurs. And, and I send it around and I tell the students, try to get one of those seeds out of there. It's very hard to do. So you're talking about white gold because the Industrial Revolution was resting on cotton. And no way to, to, to get it produced in such quantity that it could feed the textile mills of New England and Britain and continental Europe. So the whole, the whole world was complicit in this system. Financiers, insurance, you could buy slave life insurance. And, and this is the world that, that hit me in the stomach when I saw this. So what did I decide this meant to me? I felt that I had done, as I looked at this, I had that moment in a, in a, in a flash. I thought, my God, Charles, I have done exactly the same thing that my antebellum ancestors had done. I was not looking slavery in the face, but I was looking the segregated Jim Crow South in the face every day and not seeing the degradation and the humiliation that was visited on people simply because of the color of their skin. I had grown up in the Jim Crow South oblivious to what was going on around me. So I decided at that moment that, that I was gonna try to write about it and me. I was gonna try to write about this. I was gonna try to write about my history. I've reached the age where I can write where I want, write what I want. <laughs> Uh, historians are trained not to put themselves into their history. This is graduate school fair voting, not to do this. We're social scientists, we're to be above the fray. 
Well, I decided I didn't want to be above the fray when it came to this, and, and so I thought I would write about my own experience growing up in, in the segregated culture of the Jim Crow South on the white side of the color line. And I tried to see if I could get inside the mind that created this. I read the letters, every letter I could get my hands on, to and from a Richmond slave trader. Talk about a dismal research experience. I spent a sabbatical reading every slave trade letter to or from that I could find. Because I wanted to get inside the mind that created this and see if in the process I could learn anything about how I created my mind and the forces that created my mind. And see in the end if we were cut from the same cloth. So I set out to write my story and then to write a, a, a sort of what, investigation of this document and the world that lay behind it, the mindset that lay behind it. It's a hybrid book. It's a strange breed of cat, as my father would call it. And I tried to pull it together in the end in a conclusion, which the students that Joel Barlow had read, or had been asked to read, and I think most of them had. Uh, a little better than some of my students on occasion. <laughs> when, uh, when we launch a discussion in class and I say X, Y, or Z, what did this mean to you? And I get a blank stare. Uh, I didn't get many of those yesterday. I was enormously impressed with those students at your high school. They're, they're, they're a bright bunch of kids and it was a pleasure to be there. Um, so, this, this hybrid book, this is what it is. I've tried to fold these two together. and. I'm going to talk about me today more than about the, the slave trade document, but, but let me start by telling you my reaction when I first saw the cover of my book. Um, I forget the name you used, um, Sarah, uh, adorable or something along <laughs> those lines. Uh, let's face it, I was a beautiful babe. <laughs> What's happened since, I cannot uh, account for or explain away, but I was, I was a nice looking kid. There's no question about it. And, and I'm sitting in my mother's lap. She's been cropped, the full picture's in the book. And I had not seen the dust jacket work up. And my publisher, University of Virginia Press, sent me a, an email and the dust jacket was in a PDF. And I opened the PDF and saw my face with the words, the making of a racist, and I was rocked. I went back on my heels. Is this really what I want the cover of my book to look like? <laughs> and then I thought, absolutely, this is perfect. Because the first things I remember about my life, and for those of you who were at the high school yesterday, you heard me say this there. The first things I remember as a human being are sitting in my mother's lap and having her read to me. And I brought the book with me today. This is the book that she read to me. And I'm going to read you a brief passage from the beginning of this book. It, it's a children's book called Ezekiel. And Ezekiel is a little colored boy who lives on the St. John's River in Louisiana, in, in Florida. And the book is entirely in dialect. And the stick figures, you're welcome to come up and look at this after we finish. I don't do PowerPoint and electronics, so <laughs> come, come take a look at the original. Um, it, it is a, a, a remarkably offensive children's book. It's a remarkably offensive book by any man. You will be appalled at what you hear, and I take no pleasure, believe me, in reading this to you. But I want you to understand the first words I remember about my life. And they're out of this book. Away down in Sanford, Florida, there lives a little colored boy, and he names Ezekiel. And this boy, he lived with his pappy and his sister, Emancipation, and his brother, little Plur, and Asafeta to the baby. And one time, pappy didn't have no money to buy bread and butter and bacon and breeches and things, and so one morning when Ezekiel was done dressing himself, he said, Mammy, these here old breeches is so wore out, they won't hardly stay on. Mammy say, how else going to get something to eat, much less breeches? Your pappy ain't got no job. Ezekiel say, I get us something to eat. And he got a little old fishing pole out of the shed, 
and went off up the road, and Emancipation went along pulling the baby in a little old cart, and a little plural went along taking the baby can. These are the first words I remember in my life. And they happened sitting in my mother's lap. She was a lovely woman, kind, decent, deeply Christian, didn't have a mean bone in her body. One of those people I described to the students yesterday, one of those people you feel better after you've talked to them. You know anybody like that? They're pretty rare. There was a sort of inherent goodness in her. But she had no doubts whatsoever about reading this book to me because she was as deeply immersed in that culture as was my father, who was a highly intelligent, well-trained lawyer. My mother wore her racism with a, a velvet glove. My, my father wore his with an iron fist. His, his was visible on his sleeve. It was visible in the language he used to refer to people of color who my mother did not allow my older brother John or I to use. But they were both complicit. I remember asking her when I was a little bit older why the, the African American people who worked for us, Illinois Browning Culver, who worked in our home, who, who cooked, who, clothed, who, uh, who uh, uh, washed the clothes, who, who ironed, who cleaned the house, why Illinois and, and Ed, I never knew his last name, who kept the yard, why they lived on one side of town and we lived on the other. And she said, Charles, that's the way things are supposed to be. They're happy on their side of town. We're happy on our side of town. That's God's way of doing things. She was as deeply immersed in this culture as my father, despite all of her sterling qualities. And that's the world I grew up in. And, and the racism I absorbed, the word I've used is osmosis. I absorbed it. I didn't require verbal instruction for so much of this thing. I simply observed how my parents, people I respected, deeply loved, who I tried to model myself after as a boy, how my parents behaved around people of color, how my aunts and uncles, people I respected and admired, behaved around people of color. And that whole etiquette of race relations that governed the way white and black interacted in the South. Etiquette may seem odd word. We're not talking about post book of etiquette. We're talking about the rigid structures that defined the way black and white interacted with each other. And that was really mandatory if you were dark skinned because it was dangerous for you not to act in this way. You were always, if you were, if you were an African American, you were deferential around white people. You knew to call them by words like Miss Amy instead of Mrs. Do. There was a whole elaborate, my mother's name was Amy, there was a whole elaborate system by which we were regulated. Um, we never shook hands across the color line. When we were refer referring to an adult Negro, as the word was then, we never said Mr. or Mrs. or Miss. We used their first names. In our uh, kitchen, in our cupboards, we had the china that we ate off of. And in a corner of the cupboard were some orange china plates and bowls and a couple of jelly glasses that Illinois Browning Culver and Ed used when they had lunch at our house. They ate in our kitchen. We never ate with them. That was absolutely forbidden. They ate in our kitchen, at our kitchen table. But they ate off different china. And as a child, I knew never to use that china. And we would use the china that was, was separate from that. And, and Illinois would cook for us. She didn't cook all the time, but she cooked on occasion. This was the pre-air-conditioned South. This was St. Petersburg, Florida uh, in the 1940s and 50s. Air condition hadn't been invented. Uh, and, and if it got too hot to cook, my mother would say, Illinois, would you fry chicken for us before you leave tonight? And she could do it better than my mother could, so we were always glad when that happened, but she couldn't eat off our plates. And we knew we were not to eat off hers. So, so you grow up in that society, you grow up in that culture, and you absorb this stuff. 
I had an illustration of the power of, of the Jim Crow system when I was eight years old that is, is as vivid to me as it was yesterday. And every child who grew up in the South, black or white, during this era, has a moment like this. Just as an aside, one of the things that's happened to me since I've written the book and been talking about it, and particularly in the South, when I've had a mixed audience and I've had some older African American men and women in, in the audience, when I start talking about this incident that I'm going to tell you, I see them start to nod. Every one of those folks remembers that moment when they had it illustrated to them what it meant to be black and be on the wrong side of the color line in this society. And so many of them have come up and told me their stories. And, and I consider that a gift. Maybe one I don't deserve. But, but it, it establishes a bond with the people I'm talking to that, that maybe is, is valuable in, in the sense that here am I, here I'm a white guy talking about the pain uh, that this system inflicted. Here's the incident. I was eight years old. It was the end of World War II. Uh, rationing was over. We had started using the car again. We may have a few people in the audience who remember those days. And my father would drop me off. I was in grade school. He would drop me off on the way to his office. He lived, uh, we, we lived on the north side of town, the better side of St. Petersburg. All the black folks lived on the south side of town. And we would drive down uh, past my school, and he would drop me at school to go on to his office. And we were going out of our living room to get in our car, uh, he to go to work, me to go to school. When an African-American man approached our house, was coming across our lawn, his name was Bill. He owned Bill's Shoeshine Park downtown. And my father wore spectator shoes. I bet we have some people here who remember men's spectator shoes. Those two-tone shoes, dark on the outside, white on the instep, handsome men's shoes, hell of a thing to polish. So my father had his shoes polished at Bill's Shoeshine Park. And something had happened the day before. I don't know what it was. He had heard a comment, or maybe an aside from one of the shoeshine boys. They were all grown men. And my father had stormed off, clearly. And Bill, I never knew his last name, Bill was coming to our house to apologize to my father in hopes of getting his business back. And as he came across the lawn, he said, Mr. Dew, I'm so sorry. And my father exploded in rage, furious. I had never, I was terrified. I had never seen him so angry, so out of control. Cursing Bill, calling in names. I don't, I don't remember because I was too scared. But the, me the memory is as vivid as, as me sitting here. What had Bill done? He had come to the wrong door of our house. He had come to a middle door off the living room instead of the back door. And if you were African American and you approached a white home, there was one door you could use, and that was the back door. And that, that, that was my moment in which the Jim Crow system came to me in all of its fury and force, and yet I didn't see what was there. I remembered my father's fury, I remembered what triggered it, but this didn't make me a convert. The scales did not fall from my eyes. And I went to Williams College as a freshman in 17, at 17, crossed the Potomac for the first time as a racist. How in the hell did I end up at Williams? <laughs> Given my father, my father was the first generation of his family to go to college. His father died when he was quite young. His two brothers, who had got, never got past uh, high school, paid for his education at the University of Virginia, his law degree there. So my father deeply believed in the value of education. And his way of measuring a well-educated person was how they used the language. If they wrote well and spoke well, he thought they had been well-educated. 
And he was in New York representing a client who wanted to build a toll bridge across uh, Tampa Bay, connecting Tampa and St. Petersburg. So my father was up in New York talking to bond attorneys and investment bankers and financiers. And my brother and I were, were coming along in, in middle school, junior high, high school, early. And my father was looking for the right college for us. So whenever he ran into one of these men who used the language well, he asked them where they had gone to college. And a disproportionate number of them said, Williams College. And my father said, where the hell's that? <laughs> they had never heard of the place. <laughs> well, they told him. It turned out he had a friend in St. Petersburg who had gone to Bowdoin. So he was able to get some additional information. And he decided that's where my brother should go. And probably I should go too. This, this men's college in the western hills of the Berkshires in Massachusetts with, with a good teaching reputation and a great liberal arts curriculum. That's what he believed in, liberal arts. My brother and I were at an independent school in Virginia, a place called Woodbury Forest. Uh, some of you may have heard of it. it it's a boys' school. Uh, the St. P. High had been built back in the boom. Uh, it was falling apart. They were running two shifts in the high school, one from 7 to 5, one from, uh, uh, I'm sorry, 7 to noon, one from noon to 5. Not a good situation. And my father said to my brother John and I, now I'm not going to force you to go away, but you'd be making a big mistake to go to St. Pete High because the place is just not what it was when I went to. So John decided to go away and he, he, he was there and seemed to like it and, and came time for me to decide and I decided, okay, I had taken his bed in the better room and I'd done all that stuff <laughs> little brothers do. But I decided, okay, this is probably a good thing. So I, I did too. We both went to Woodbury. When John graduated, my father said, you're going to Williams. And he said, I don't want to go to Williams. I want to go to UVA and major in fraternity life. <laughs> he, he didn't say that to my father. That's what he was intending. We've been at this monastic boys' school uh, for three years. Sure. And my father said, no. He said, I'm paying the bill. You go to Williams for a year. If you don't like it, you can transfer. So off John went, went to Williams. And I just, as I've said, toddled along after him because he loved the college and came back and talked about it in his classes and per particularly his professors. Uh, and I thought, okay, John's there. That, that, that's good. I'll be, a, I'll be a freshman. We use that gender-specific term then. It's now first year or frosh. <laughs> uh, I was a freshman and John would be a junior and that, that would be okay. I wouldn't see too much of him, but if I really got into trouble, Big Brother would be there. Um, so there I was on the Williams College campus, a dyed-in-the-wool racist at age 17 in Yankee Land for the first time in a dormitory entry system with an African-American classmate. The first time in my life I had ever been in an environment where I was on the same plane as someone who was of African-American descent. And my second day on campus, I did something that I'm still so embarrassed about that it took me until 2016 to say what I'm going to tell you right now. Uh, I had been so embarrassed by my actions that, that I had never even told my wife. But I was in a Williams College winter study class with an African American uh, colleague, wonderful woman named, named Leslie Brown. She's no longer with us, unfortunately. And we were reading autobiographies about the black and white South over, over the, 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 the course of the winter study. We would read uh, Lillian Smith's Killers of the Dream, wonderful autobiography of white women growing up in Georgia and, and seeing what, what Jim Crow was like. Uh, we, we read the, the wonderful uh, autobiography called Coming of Age in Mississippi. The, the author's name should be in the front of my mind and it's not. But we were doing this. We were going back and forth. And, and we had a wonderful class of women, a very diverse class of women students. And there was a level of trust that developed in that classroom. And, and I felt for the first time I could tell what I'm going to tell you and, and what I wrote in the book. I was in an open, uh, open I was in a, a dorm room with one of my friends with the door open. And my African American classmate, Ted Wynn, walked down the stairs as I was telling a dialect joke. 
I was telling a Rastus and Lulabelle joke in dialect. And Rastus had a deep bass, and Lulabelle had a high falsetto, and I was imitating the voices as I was telling that joke. And Ted Wynn, my African American classmate, walked down the stairs. I had done something my mother had, had taught my brother and I never to do. <coughs> never humiliate anyone and never humiliate yourself. And I had done both if he heard me. I knew that. And I had to know if he had heard me. So the next day, he was in the quad, in the frosh quad, and I came out of the entry. <coughs> And I walked over to him and said, hi, I'm Charles Dew. We're in the same entry. And it's the first time I had ever shaken hands across the color line. I was 17 years old. My education at Williams began before I entered my first classroom. Because that was the first time I had broken that etiquette that I was telling you about. That governed the way we always behaved around black folks and black folks always behaved around us. We were equals. And that was the beginning of a very slow and very evolutionary one step forward, one step back process by which I managed to get out from under that toxic rock of racism that I had grown up under for the first 17 years of my life. And it did not happen overnight. It still amazes me as I look back on it now how long it took me to break out of that culture. It was a step forward, a step back, a step forward, a step back. And I talk about that in the book, and I'm embarrassed to write some of the stuff I write about myself. I kept my books, and I could find passages that I had underlined in my books, in which, say, Abraham Lincoln in the Lincoln-Douglas debates had said disparaging things about black people and defended white supremacy, and then added, as Lincoln always did, but just because the black man is inferior does not mean he is denied everything. He deserves to have the, the fruits of his own labor, the bread which he earns with his own hand. This is Illinois, 1858. Lincoln, the politician, trying to survive the assault of Stephen A. Douglas, who was accusing him over and over and over again of being excessively fond of the Negro. And that's not the language he used. And, and I would underline that, and I would bring it into class and say, well, this is what Lincoln said. I did that one day, and my professor and I were in our big Chapin Hall. Some of you in here from Williams remember Chapin Hall. And there was a speaker coming, and he was the editor of the Charleston News and Courier. And he was coming to defend segregation and attack the Brown decision, 1954, the integrated schools. And my teacher saw me enter Chapin Hall, and he looked at me, and he yelled across the room, and he said, Charles, you should be up there on the stage with that guy. Well, I didn't like that. <laughs> and then the guy gave the worst speech talk I'd ever heard in my life. <laughs> Boring. He had a loose leaf binder and he had it all written out and he would read one page and he'd flip the next page. And I, and I said, to him, I've been defending this in class. This guy's an idiot. And, and it, was, it was moments like that. I, I could describe some more of them. But, but I gradually began to wonder what in the hell I had been doing growing up in the South and, and dealing with people like those people, good people who had come to our home. Um, cliches exist like that for a reason, because, because they do happen. And that happened to me. And I'm eternally grateful to her, and I dedicated the book to her as, as a means of, of belatedly saying thank you. Um, I started driving her home. And, you know, boys get their driver's license, and, and uh, first thing I want to do is get behind the wheel. And I wanted to do that, but I also wanted to talk to her. I wanted to find out what her life was like. And I knew this was not going to be easy because of that etiquette that we had grown up with. And one day we were driving to her house. Oh, by the way, this tells you something. She lived in a house that my mother and father had helped her and her husband, Joe, buy because she had been living in, in a ramshackle, dilapidated house with a leaky roof and bad screens and mosquitoes keeping her up at night, owned by one of my father's clients. And my father had gone before the city council in St. Petersburg to argue against the housing ordinance that would force this slumlord to clean up his properties. But Illinois worked for us 
And therefore, there was that sort of patron-client relationship. And we didn't want someone who worked in our home being treated this way. So we, my mother and father, helped her and Joe buy their own house. That's classic Jim Crow culture. The system, you don't touch. The individuals, maybe you can do something nice for because you, you know them. They're hardworking people. They have, they, have, they have served you as a domestic servant for years. So you help them get out of their situation. But the system, <laughs> don't touch it. I was the only, word, only person in my family ever to go in her house. Because one of the days when I dropped her off at her house, she said, Charles, would you like to come in and see the house? I said, sure. So I walked in, and it was, it was beautifully clean. It was nicely furnished, nothing elaborate. Nice home. Her, her dog smudge came out, and I scratched it behind the ears. And, and I said, oh, my, this is, this is a lovely house. I'm, I'm so glad you, you and Joe live here. I left and went home, and I came in the kitchen, and my mother, dear, as we called her, my brother had started that. I could tell you that, but I don't want to go on for too long. Uh, she said, uh, said, did you drop Illinois off? And I said, yes. And, and uh, incidentally, she invited me in, and I went into her home. My mother made me sit down in the kitchen and describe everything I had seen in elaborate detail. She wanted to know every inch of that, that house that I had seen. What's going on here? As a teenage kid, it was okay for me to go in there. As a white woman, it was not such a good idea for her to enter a black home. So although my mother and father had helped them acquire this home, they had never been in it. And she wanted to know what was there. So that's, that's the way this culture operated. And that's what I managed to get out from under during the time I was in college. Let me get back to Illinois in our conversation. Uh, we, were, we were going home one day, and I knew she had one child, a son, Roosevelt, who had left St. Petersburg as soon as he was old enough to get out. And he had gone to California, gotten a good job with an airline, I think, and, and I, I used that as my icebreaker. I said, Illinois, you know, it's a shame that Roosevelt had to leave St. Petersburg because of something like race. <coughs> And she looked over at me, and she was silent. There was a long pause. This was dangerous territory for her. <clears throat> she would be breaking one of the, the, the profound rules of etiquette. You don't talk about race. You don't talk about prejudice. You don't talk about injustice. And she looked at me, and she paused, and then she said, Charles, it is a shame he had to leave because of race. And that meant that we could talk about anything. And I learned so much from her. Just to give you a couple of examples. She told me that she could buy a dress at the department stores downtown, but she couldn't dry, try it on before she bought it. And if when she got it home, she tried it on and it didn't fit, she couldn't take it back. She had a, had a routine when she cleaned our living room, uh, cleaned our, our, our house, actually, that she would get to the living room about the time a quiz show came on. And, and the only television we had in the house was one of these big old Dumont boxes. Anybody here remember those big, massive, cost of fortune? We had one television. It was in the, in the front room. And she had asked my mother if it was all right if she turned on the television and watched it while she dusted and cleaned the living room. And, and my mother said, sure. Well, I had noticed that she always got to the living room about the same time the Price is Right came on. Bill Cullen. Anybody remember the Price is Right? Yeah, a few folks remember Bill Cullen and the Price is Right. And I, I had noticed that, and I said, Illinois, you must love Bill Cullen and the Price is Right because I noticed you watch it when you get to the living room. She said, I do watch it, Charles. Bill Cullen is the only quiz show that has colored folks on as guests. I was oblivious to all of this, totally oblivious to all of this. And, and learning all of this got me, got me really out from under the, the culture in which I had been raised. And of course, it led to a, a blow up with my father. 
Um, that was one of the questions the students very perceptively asked uh -huh. yesterday. <laughs> How did your father take this? Not well. And he knew what was happening, but, but we had never had a flat out argument about anything relating to race. And it happened in the spring term of my senior year. I was, I was home and we were having dinner in the, in the dining room in our home. And my father, who was a very good lawyer, was chewing on a bone he never got tired of chewing on, which was the Brown decision, 1954, that integrated the schools. This was a travesty and an unconstitutional, and, and uh, Earl Warren had browbeat the rest of the judges into a unanimous, and he was going on, and I was up to here. And so I almost shouted, I said, Pop, the Brown decision is perfectly justified by the language of the 14th Amendment, equal protection of the law. I think I know more constitutional history than you do. <laughs> One didn't say that sort of thing to one's father in that era. Shouldn't say such a thing to one's father today. But I had done so. And my mother, he didn't speak to me. I left, went back to college the next day. He didn't speak to me before I left. When I bought, got back to school, my mother tracked me down on the payphone. There cells in those days. There were payphones in, in the dorms in my fraternity house. She tracked me down on the payphone and said, Charles, you've got to apologize to your father. I've never seen him so hurt. And I literally sat down to think about it. I was 21 years old. I had just won a Woodrow Wilson Fellowship that was going to pay for my entire graduate study in history. I was feeling my oats. And yet, I loved my father. In many ways, he was a very decent man. Uh, the racism that he felt uh, was, was, was a flaw that he had inherited from his mother. He used the same language who he did, uh, that he did. And I loved my father, and I decided I would make that call. I don't remember what we said. I remember it was a brief conversation. He accepted my apology, and we hung up. And that was the last time we talked about race. He realized that if he gave voice to this, I was going to react. And I realized if I gave voice to my feelings, he was going to react. So we had a truce, an undeclared, unannounced truce. And I'm glad, grateful that I had the maturity at age 21 to do that because I didn't want an irreparable breach with my father, and that would have happened if we had continued this argument. His feelings were that strong, and my feelings were becoming that strong in the opposite direction. He wanted me in the hospital room with him the night he died, and I would not have been there if I hadn't made that phone call. Families are complicated, right? <laughs> We make compromises. We figure things out. We, we, we do the best we can do. And that's what I did on that occasion, and I'm very grateful that I had the good sense at that, at that age to do it. I've probably gone on long enough. Uh, I don't want to burn every, every minute of the time we have together, but let me end with this. The most profound thing I heard on the subject that I've written about and was, was thinking about in, in that day and time came from Illinois. And we were driving home one day and I said something, I don't remember exactly, but I was saying something about all these crazy Jim Crow customs. Uh, and they were crazy, I mean, just one example. Florida had textbooks used in public schools and the textbooks were housed in separate but presumably equal warehouses. <laughs> books for white, books for color, separate warehouses. I don't think I knew that at that time, but I knew about the separate water fountains and the separate uh, restrooms. And I said, Illinois, where did all these crazy Jim Crow customs come from? And she looked over at me and she was almost in tears. I think she was on the verge of tears. And she said, Charles, why do the white folks put so much hate in the children? Why do the white folks put so much hate in the children? And she nailed it. She nailed it precisely and exactly. Racism was transferred from one generation to the next almost like a genetic trait. Mm -hmm. 
And it didn't have to be, as I said at the beginning, verbal instruction. It was that process of absorption and osmosis. So when I, I talk about this, particularly to young people, I try to leave them with some sort of idea of, of what they can do, what they might think about doing. Uh, this isn't easy, um, and, and one size doesn't fit all, one solution is not going to do everything we would like it to do. But I tell them several things. I say, if, if you know any dialect jokes, give them up. You don't need them. They aren't very funny. If you know any, don't tell them. I say, don't support any politicians who play the race card. You don't have to vote for their opponent, but don't vote for them. Don't give them money. Don't give them approval. Don't listen to them. Don't talk positively about them. Because what they're doing is pernicious and hurting our, our, our civic life and our society. I tell them if they hear a friend or somebody they know say something racist, say something. This isn't easy. But as I said to the students yesterday, silence is not an option now. Stakes are too high. If you hear somebody say something racist, say something along the lines of, you know, that hurts me. I have classmates, I have teammates, I have people I sing with, I have people I, I, I'm on teams with, I have people I'm in drama groups with, and that hurts me. Nobody can argue about how you feel. And it may make them think before they say something like that again out in public. I came to that through the experience my wife and I had. Our older son is gay. And he came out in the 90s when it was a different world. And people were telling, telling homophobic gay jokes all the time and making disparaging comments, homophobic comments. And we would go out and we would hear these things and we wouldn't say anything. And we'd come home and feeling like we, we, we had to take a shower. We felt like we had betrayed our son. So we decided if we heard that sort of thing, we were going to say, you know, our older son Steve is gay. I find that very hurtful. You talk about educational. <laughs> Created some tense moments, but we never heard anything like that from those people again. And we felt better because we had spoken out. Socially awkward, but believe me, it's worth it. You'll, you'll, you'll feel better if you have to have occasion to do something like that. So particularly when I'm trying to, I'm talking to young people, I try to give them something to think about that, that, that will be, I hope, at least moderately constructive as we try to repair this world that has been so torn and uh, damaged uh, recently. And, and, and we try to get back to a place where we could feel that progress was being made, that we were moving in the right direction because because I really see that as, as critical to our, our collective future as a country. Um, I have gone on too long and I want you to ask me questions and I don't know how much time we have but I'd love to have some, some Q&A. Uh, anybody have any questions? Okay, first, first hand is in front. Um, you didn't finish the story. Did you find out whether your friend had heard you tell that um, joke? Oh, uh, Ted. Had, had Ted heard the joke? No. He gave no evidence to hear the joke, and we became friends. He was from Worcester, Massachusetts. I was from the Deep South. We became friends. And that was one of the, one of the things that, that I really prize in my uh, Williams career. He, he died recently, and, and it was a great loss. Illinois, um how are these decent, good people unable or unwilling to see the evil? And then what is it that we're doing to our children? And so asking you as a historian, is there anything we can do to help us watch our language, to be more attentive to our semantic habits, and to recognize what, what it is we're saying? For example, people of color, well, what, what's, do white people say that phrase, and are we of color? And the second is uh, we recognize that uh, the code words, the dog whistles that are now prevalent. Mm -hmm. America first is a racist. 
or Hoover. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You only yeah. have to go back to the 1920s and 30s to see how it developed in Calvin Coolidge's writings, for example. It works. So but, how do uh, we, it, how it, do we it, recognize right now that yeah. I'm using language that, that hurts the other victims, continues, causes our children harm? Uh, good question. And, and people of color is, is a word that, that my African American colleagues at the college use regularly to describe not only people of African descent, but, but Latino, uh, Latina, um, Asian American, Asian uh, pe people, um, people of uh, Native American descent. Uh, it's, it's a generic term. It's probably not the best, but it's what is currently in use. Um, you know, I think all we can do is the best we can do. Uh, try, try to be, be thoughtful, be careful. Try to put yourself in the shoes of someone different from you and, and, and try and, and think about how you would react if you heard something coming from you in your shoes as opposed to the other shoes that you are wearing for the moment. Just, just try to do the best you can do to be, to be aware and be conscious. Yes. Excuse me, you tell a story in the book. Hold on, I don't think people can hear you in the back. No, okay, I, I will repeat what you tell me. That's my voice. Okay. Um, you told a story in the book of where you gave a talk to teachers, and there was a um, yes. teacher. Yes. Yes. Would you yes. say something about that? Yes, the, the that question was, was I had given a talk on one of my books at a, at a group of high school teachers um, in Virginia, and, and the, the story goes like this. I, I had written a book called Bond of Iron, Master and Slave of Buffalo Forge. I, I was interested in, in slave, skilled slave workers, and I discovered a body of material. I was interested particularly in iron workers. I did my doctoral dissertation on a, on a Richmond Ironworks called the Treader Ironworks, and if you know the Civil War, you know that was the chief munitions manufacturer for the Confederacy. And the Treader used slave iron workers in, in their operations, but the records on them were very sparse, and I wanted to know more about that, so I started doing a study of slave iron workers, and I ran into this body of material on one community that was so rich that I decided I was going to study that one place. And that in turned into a book. And I was invited to this conference to talk about the book and talk about industrial slavery, which is actually a fascinating topic. Um, after I finished, a teacher uh, got up and, and Ray asked the first question. He was African American. I think he taught at a middle school somewhere in the Midwest. By the way, we were at Robert E. Lee's ancestral home, Stratford Hall, in Virginia, for this conference on slavery, which which I love. I mean, I thought that was wonderful. But here we were, uh, in, in in the midst of the man who tried to establish the the Confederacy. Um, so I acknowledged this, and he he, he rose and he said. How did someone as white as you get interested in our history? <laughs> well, that's an interesting question. I mean, I'm a white guy. I can't, I can't deny that for a second. And, and I thought, how am I going to answer him? And I do, as I said in the book, I do what teachers often do. I came up with the first thing that came into my head that seemed kind of next to it, but not an answer. Dancing as fast as I can, I think is what I said. And I said, well, I started at the trailer and the slave owners, and I couldn't find enough, and I, I realized I wasn't answering his question. And I stopped. And I said, I don't think I'm answering your question. And I think the answer is, I was trying to find out something about myself, how I had grown up in the Jim Crow South and not realized the world that I was complicit in creating. A thought not unlike I had when I saw that document, although this was more powerful. And I said, I've never really thought about this before. I've never really answered this question before, but my, my, I've been studying, I've been trying to understand the South, and I've been trying to understand the totality of the society and how it can do what it does and behave the way it does. And I think I was trying to understand how I had been complicit in the Jim Crow system when I was growing up in that culture. And, and that was an answer he seemed to accept. And I, I, I'm, I'm sorry I didn't sort of build on that self-revelation um, as, as 
thoroughly as I should have. Um, I was too much, too much captured by my training as a grad student at that point. Historians don't mess with history by putting themselves into it. You find out what happened, you're a social scientist, and you tell the story as objectively and as sanitized as you can. And so that notion of putting myself into the story didn't occur to me then. I was younger. It, it, it occurred to me probably because I was older, because that slave trade circular had such a profound effect on me. Yes, sir. Richard. Uh, you know, thinking about uh, a quote by Baldwin. Uh, Baldwin said once, uh, not everything that is fixed can be changed. Uh, everything that is changed has been and has to be faced. And I'm, you're, I'm reminded of your talk, and I think when you talk about racism, so many people haven't faced it. Yeah. And uh, I, I hear your testimony, yeah. you faced it. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the beginning of many stages for evolving issues. You know. I, that's, that's beautifully said, thank you. Yes, ma'am. You speak so much about, um, in your book, about did people feel guilt? And, and I remember I read through those two letters line by line, and, and before I read the rest of it, I came to the same conclusions you did, which is not really. Mm -hmm. Because the economic question comes before the human mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but I also share a background of um, very active Confederates in Virginia, mm -hmm. and a great, great, great grandfather killed at Manassas. Mm -hmm whose last name was Lee, mm -hmm. plus the Winthrop's who really started slavery in Massachusetts. Okay. Mm -hmm. And because of early interactions with an African-American girl, I had the same kind of things. But I think what you, your story is extraordinary because you were only 16 or 17 when you were driving her. Mm -hmm. No, no, I was in college. Oh, well, all right, 18. Okay. But you were... <laughs> More like 19. 19. <laughs> no, but you were still, you know, you're, yeah. you know, yeah. there's something about you that was ready to be convinced. And I think it's beautiful. Well, thank you. That, 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 that happened at Williams. I, yeah, I really feel like that's a very big part of your story that doesn't happen to everybody. Well, thank you. That may be right. I, I have a deep affection for Williams College. Mm -hmm. I really do. Mm -hmm. um, I don't tell my colleagues that because they're they're probably mad about this or that. But but I really feel very grateful to that place. And the teachers, the teachers I had. The second part of the question is, what do we do with? I mean, I've struggled forever about the whole concept of reparations, mm -hmm. especially personal reparations. Right. You know, where does that lead us? Yeah. Um, that's Obviously, you are teaching and you are writing a book, and, yeah. and that, that is massive yeah. personal reparations. But that's a, that's a struggle yeah. that, um, that I think a lot of us, in, and even in New England, I mean, New England, the triangle, triangle trade, triangular trade, sure. you know, of, of Connecticut, New London, and mm -hmm. Providence, etc. Yeah. Yeah. That's why New Englanders are wealthy. I yeah. mean, <coughs> to, to, to a considerable degree, yeah. The, the question, could everybody hear? Uh, the question in the end was, was reparations. So. Politically very difficult. Mm -hmm. In terms of justice, certainly warranted. Um, how we get from here to there is a good question. I think a starter would be giving everyone a first-rate education, which means committing the resources to do that to enable people, no matter what their origin, to have a, a, a clear and honest shot at success, and to, to, to educate everyone to their fullest ability, I think would be a great place to start. At the end of the road, does it involve the same sort of, of compensation we gave to Japanese Americans who we interred mm -hmm. after World War II? Or like the Germans have done, to the, the surviving victims of the Holocaust, billions of dollars. Um, the Germans have figured out that you have to face history and you have to produce the resources that indicate that you mean it. And we have yet to do that. We had no Truth and Reconciliation Commission after the Civil War. 
to look at the origins of the war, the way secession was launched to defend slavery, and the racial order built on slavery. Uh, we have yet to acknowledge what, what the, the, the slave system. I see, for a slave. And then I think that speaks to the idea of reparations in education. Certainly a severe whipping. Uh, if you were taught to read and write, the person who taught you would be reprimanded. Often they were children who were playing together. They would be reprimanded. But if you learned to read and write and you were a slave, you were undoubtedly whipped. You were at grave risk of being sold because you would be considered a troublemaker and a potential provocateur. If you could read, you could understand maybe what was in the newspapers that was constantly castigating abolitionists and offering a bounty on the head of William Lloyd Garrison if he was moved to Georgia, 5,000 bucks. They wanted to, to convict him and hang him for inciting slave insurrection. If you could read, you were dangerous. So at minimum whipping at, at, at probably pretty certain risk sale. So yeah, the, the, after Nat Turner's insurrection, slave law was tightened in the South. Uh, and the 30 years before the war, it became illegal a crime to teach a slave to read or write. It became illegal for more than three slaves to gather in one place. It became illegal for a slave to leave a property without a pass. Uh, the, the whole system was, was tightened down in an effort to prevent another net turn. Yeah, um, I grew up here in writing, and uh, one of my grandfathers was from Missouri, and the other one was a swamp Yankee. He worked for Mark Twain. Uh, mm -hmm. I, as a kid, I, I met Walter White, who was the head of the yeah. NACP, and, yeah. and I also worked for uh, Annie Green, who came from Atlanta, or Dust, or something like that. And she used to say things. And she was a lovely person, and she felt for other people. She said, like, there's nothing like a good old hat, a fancy hat. So I'm not, I, I grew up around you know, all kinds of people, you know what I mean? And I want to thank you, first of all, for a very heartfelt and, and honest, uh, you know, from the heart. Thank you. Talk. I have about... 320 questions to ask you. Maybe <laughs> afterward, I think. <laughs> Let me get to at least two. Okay, sure. On, John. All right. Well, this, your mother talked about they live over here, there and where, and that's, did she say that's what God wanted it to be? Yeah. See that, and, and then you think about, about things like the family in the 30s and what the hell they've done in the prayer breakfast. The Civil War still goes on. Agreed. The other thing that I want to ask you about is Nathan Bedford Forrest. Did they ever teach you about him? Uh, no. Supposedly there are more monuments in the South to that man than George, in the country, yeah. than George Washington. Nathan Bedford Forrest, for those of you who don't know Civil War history, was, was a vicious <coughs> cavalry commander in the Civil War. He had been a slave trader before the war. He was a very successful cavalry commander, but he was also responsible for the Fort Pillow Massacre, when a group of U.S. colored troops were captured by his cavalry. They were slaughtered by, by uh, the men in, in his cavalry regiment, Forrest Cavalry Regiment. Um, there are statues of him all over the South, including Memphis. Memphis has a predominantly African-American majority and government, and they took it down. The state of Tennessee immediately passed laws preventing municipalities from doing this, the Republican legislature. Uh, but, but it was a done deed by then. Uh, no, Forrest is about the epitome of, of the worst of the Confederacy, I think yet revered by pro-Confederate military types who see him as, as the quintessential Confederate who showed what should have been done. Raise the black flag, war, war, war to the end. And if we had had more forest, we would have won the war. Uh, what they don't realize is a, a victory for the Confederacy would have created a slave-based republic that would have lasted for decades. Slavery would have existed into the late 19th, maybe even into the early 20th century in the South. Because slavery was not only a labor system, slavery was a system of social control. 
Four million people in 1865 were freed, and the white South was afraid of them because they were fearful that an insurrection could, could arise, and there would be a race war, and they talked constantly, if, if this ever happened, our white women are going to be raped by black men, and the purity of the race is going to be destroyed forever. And they articulate, I've written a book on secession, and this is the message. This is what they said over and over and over again. So what, what, you're, what you're doing when you put the Confederate flag on your truck or put it up on your, on your hat or put it on the, on the flag on the, on the radio aerial of your car, you're saying, I'm cheering for the slave-based republic that would have existed if this flag had emerged triumphant in the Civil War. Incidentally, that St. Andrew's Cross, that's not the stars and bars. I try to teach my students this because they've studied Southern history. The stars and bars are the first flag of the Confederacy, which looks very much like the American flag with a circle of stars up in the corner and then the bars going across the flag. The battle flag is not the stars and bars. Just so you'll know. <laughs> my history hat, I'm sorry. <laughs> I had to put it on. Ian, you had a question. Uh, yeah, you mentioned your ancestor, William Mary, um, really played a key role in laying the foundation for the intellectual argument of slavery. What sort of, what entailed the intellectual argument? Oh, a variety of things. Uh, he argued that basically this was a brutish, inferior people who had been uplifted by slavery and brought from darkest Africa and humanized and Christianized, that they were the most valuable species of property in Virginia other than the land itself, and he used the phrase Virginia is a Negro raising state that produces enough each year for export as well as for our own aids, in other words, an economic argument. And he particularly made the argument that emancipation would destroy this paradise, this Eden, would destroy the happiness that the Africans had achieved as being, as being slaves and predicted the tainting of the white race and violence and race war. So, so he set the parameters of the argument that was going to come and people built on that. Um, you, you can't make a rational argument on the subject, but that's what the intellectuals in the South were doing. There's virtually no decent literature that comes out of this period. Edgar Allan Poe is a, is a blip on the radar screen. There's not one decent poet in that 30 years before the Civil War. The last debate on slavery was that Virginia legislative debate, 31, 32. The, 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 the clamp down on discussion of the institution was, per, was total. If you had any questions, you left. You got the hell out of the South. So, so we, we are, we are and, and W.J. Cash in his book, The Mind of the South, has a wonderful phrase. He said, in the end, the white Southerner didn't think, he felt. And it was all coming from the gut. Sound familiar? Yeah. 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 How about two more questions? Okay. I was looking at the lady back there. Yes, ma'am. Um, since you are so articulate about the way in which one infuses these ideas of racism from generation to generation. And since we are facing such dramatic, uh, maybe it's always been there, but it, it, it seems to have become more visible and more unpleasant recently. Do you have any insight or suggestion about where would intervention help the most? I think you mentioned schooling, but the culture of homes that's passed from generation to generation seems to override whatever might happen in schools, and the teachers in the schools are perpetuating these ideas. So I would love to know if you have all this study and wisdom and experience in these issues, does anything occur to you that, that one might get behind or try to work on? Well, I think we, list, we individually need to listen to the better angels of our nature to try to act on that. Men and women thought their marriages were sacrosanct. The divorce rate among slaves was about 2%. The master breaking slave marriages was 33 to 40%. 
and I ran across this document. What the Freedmen's Bureau did, it, it put in the name of the man and woman, uh, Reuben Rucker and Louisa Jackson, as man and wife since 1831, and then it listed their children. So what the Freedmen's Bureau was doing was giving them a marriage registration and giving their children a birth certificate, because that hadn't existed under slavery. And at the bottom of the page, I saw this, and let me just read it to you. This might be a good, good note to end on. David Fielding and Ann Valley as man and wife since 1839. David Fielding born Augusta County, Virginia, age 57 years. Ann Valley died 1857, Augusta County, Virginia, age 54 years. This man came into the Lexington office of the Freedmen's Bureau nine years after his wife died mm -hmm. to recognize his marriage to her. Mm -hmm. No children. Is that, is that a good note to end on? Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. We're going to have a reception downstairs. And